video will explore journalist Nellie Bly's 10 days in a New York insane asylum. Nellie Bly was born Elizabeth Cochran in May 1864 in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In 1885, at the age of 21, she penned an anonymous response to a newspaper article in a local newspaper, the Pittsburgh Dis Dispatch. The paper's publisher was impressed by the letter writer and asked the author to reveal his or her identity. Cochran was soon writing for the dispatch and following the tradition of the time, adopted a pseudonymous pen name. She chose Nellie Bly, who was a character in a popular song by composer Stephen Foster. She worked as an investigative reporter in Pittsburgh, focusing primarily on women's issues. She then spent six months traveling to Mexico, and in 1887, she moved to New York, where it took her months to land her next job at the New York World. The World was published by Joseph Pulitzer, who was a Czech immigrant, and it specialized in sensationalist and lurid stories. This made it one of the most highly circulated papers of its day. In addition to this, it also published hard-hitting investigative pieces, which is what Bly was interested in. Just 23 years old, Bly was now one of a handful of female reporters in New York City. She was determined to make her mark, and so she accepted an unusual assignment. For years, rumors had swirled about conditions in one of the city's most notorious places, the insane asylum on Blackwell's Island. Now known as Roosevelt Island, Blackwell's was home to a number of public institutions, including a penitentiary, a poorhouse, hospitals for infectious diseases like smallpox, and the asylum. The location of these buildings on an island is important. New York authorities didn't want to expose the crowded public to highly infectious diseases like smallpox and tuberculosis. Bly's editor suggested she have herself committed to the asylum for 10 days to expose the real conditions, and Bly immediately agreed. She worked under an assumed name and told people she was a Cuban immigrant. She took a room in a boarding house and set out to prove herself insane. Now, New York City boarding houses were the first step for lunatics at the time. People who were charity cases were herded into these state-subsidized boarding homes, and they were run by usually a woman who would watch over the people in the boarding home. If there was anything strange noticed, by the boarders, there was um, a notification system where the boarding house head would notify the police or a judge and send the boarder uh, to get examined. So this is very different from the system today. We don't have boarding houses anymore, really, um, and we certainly don't have this sort of network where you could live on your own at a boarding house and if you improved you would be left alone but if you got worse you would be subject to investigation. Bly claimed to have amnesia and she came before a judge who was very perplexed and was confused whether she needed an interpreter or if she was truly mentally ill. Bly was known for stunt journalism, and so she was committed to this stunt. She always wanted to learn about asylums to know for sure that the most helpless of God's creatures were truly being taken care of. She had heard some stories about abuse and mistreatment, but she dismissed these as exa exaggerated or romances imagined by a gossipy public. She scared herself with ghost stories in order to attain a scared look on her face. Her assumed name during this experiment was Nellie Brown. She acted distant, nervous, and agitated until she disturbed the other boarding house women enough that they called for doctors. Bly then met with several doctors at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. She also met with a kind judge who attempted to classify her mental health. She went into these meetings fearing that she could not trick these men who could not be deceived after so much experience with the insane. And it's true that the judge she went before put up somewhat of a fight and wasn't incredibly convinced that she was insane. It was easier for her to convince the doctors. 
Mrs. Stannard, the matron of the boarding house who referred her, claimed that Brown's pupils have been enlarged ever since she came to the home. They have not changed once. Once determined to admit her, the doctors were not going to be convinced otherwise. While at Bellevue Hospital, Bly met another woman who was to be examined, Miss Anne Neville. Anne Neville explained that she had been a poor chambermaid, but had gotten sick and was sent to a sister's home to be treated. Her nephew then lost her job and couldn't pay her home expenses, so she had been transferred to Bellevue Hospital. She said she was not insane and that the doctors have been asking me many curious questions and confusing me as much as possible, but I know there's nothing wrong with my brain. Nearly all of the women Bly would meet were not wealthy or from immigrant families or had experienced some kind of trauma such as losing a child and their life in New York had left them with very few options. One has to remember that asylums at the time were separated by gender and so Bly was only able to see the plight of women up close but there were many cases regarding insane men in New York as well. The doctors also didn't have as great an understanding of mental illness, and so they would use questions and examinations to confirm what they had already heard rather than to possibly correct what was going on with the patient. Another instance of this is seen in the case of Tilly Mayard, a young woman recently recovered from fever but suffering a nervous debility. Her friends sent her to Bellevue, and upon learning she's being locked away, she claims her sanity to the doctor and argued, if you know anything at all, you should be able to tell that I am perfectly sane. Why don't you test me? To which the doctor responded, we know all we want on that score. After one terrible night at Bellevue with food and a hard mattress to sleep on, Bly was transferred to Blackwell's Island. Once there, she stopped acting insane and simply acted as herself. She took care to detail every part of her days in the asylum, which was a total of 10 days. Women were given slightly spoiled and cold meat, thin and flavorless broth and tea, and bread that was black and dirty and hard. Bly couldn't make herself eat it. She was used to much richer foods, and but the other residents were hungry, and they would reach over each other to reach as much food as they could and eat it without complaint. As far as I'm aware, this Blackwell's uh, Island was completely subsidized by the state, so there wasn't a requirement for patients to pay. Everything was taken care of, food, um, medical care, shelter and that's different from today where many nursing homes and these kinds of homes require financial payment. Bly was then given an ice cold bath and scrubbed ferociously all over by a nurse. She was then put in a flannel dress without being properly dried off. Her wet hair and skin made her bed sheets and pillow as wet and cold as she was, and the single wool blanket she was provided was too short to cover her feet and shoulders at the same time. This is very different from um, today. There's a lot of recollections on nursing home patients never being bathed. Um, they're not giving their own blankets. There are usually laundries on site and so it's, it is different treatment than what we see today for our poor and sick. Bly asked why there weren't more blankets or clothes or, or why people weren't being treated better and she said that this was a charity and so they only had a certain number of resources and she should be thankful for what she should get and not complain. The next morning, the patients with their still damp hair would be combed, and 45 women shared two nurses and six combs. After a thin breakfast, the patients were sent to do all the cleaning and upkeep of the institution, even cleaning the nurses' bedrooms and clothing. It was believed that this physical activity was good for the women and kept their minds occupied. For several hours of the day, the patients were made to sit still on benches and they weren't given anything therapeutic or enjoyable to do. Again, we see this similarity with nursing homes today where residents will report not being able to see a doctor or nurse for days. 
Bly reported that she was never so tired as she grew sitting on those benches. Several of the patients would sit on one foot or sideways to make a change, but they were always reproved and told to sit up straight. If they talked, they were scolded to and told to shut up. If they wanted to walk around in order to take the stiffness out of them, they were told to sit down and be still. I would like the expert physicians who are condemning me for my action to take a perfectly sane and healthy woman, shut her up, and make her sit from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. on straight back benches. Do not allow her to talk or move during these hours. Give her no reading and let her know nothing of the world or its doings. Give her bad food and harsh treatment and see how long it will take to make her insane. Two months would make her a mental and physical wreck. The uh, staff did permit the women to go for walks, and while Bly was there, it was the winter time, and she reported how cold it was to go for walks around the island and that they did not have adequate clothing. There are several stories mentioned where a woman was choked or given a black eye or had her hair pulled for whatever reason by nurses. The nurses would flirt with the doctors, gossip about each other, swear and deride one another and the patients. The institution simply didn't care, was Bly's conclusion. They didn't have enough staff, they didn't have adequate living situations, and these women were locked away so as not to disturb the happiness or conscience of the sane. After Bly's publication hit the stands and shocked and enthralled her readers, she was nearly discovered by another fellow journalist, and she urged this journalist to stay quiet so she could finish her story, a grand jury launched an investigation into conditions of the asylum, even asking Bly to accompany them on a visit to the premises. When they arrived, the asylum had been given notice of their approach, and they were definitely prepared. They updated the boat, taking them to the island. Um, they updated the kitchen to have salt and clean white bread. And the woman that Bly had been housed with had been discharged, transferred, or moved to another quarter. The grand jury's report was incredibly influenced by Bly's articles, and they called for a sum of nearly $850,000, which is about $24 million today, to be added to the budget of the Department of Public Charities and Corrections. The jury also attempted to make future examinations more thorough so that only the seriously ill were admitted into the asylums. Today, insane asylums no longer exist. There was a huge outcry due to the Pennhurst investigation under Ronald Reagan and many of these insane asylums no longer exist. And so the treatments we have today are largely medicinal. However, there's nothing in place to ensure that the mentally ill take their medicine and so many of them don't or they don't renew their prescriptions um, If you ever volunteered any of the homeless shelters, you will know that many of the homeless are violent or have been kicked out of their homes due to violence perpetuated against their relatives who no longer can take it um, jails are also becoming society's primary mental institutions, though few have the funding or expertise to carry out the role properly. Again, we shifted from a communal looking out for people using boarding houses, using uh, matrons to this sort of solve it with medicine and put the problem away kind of approach. It's also important to recognize that the conditions today for many people are worse than they were um, on Blackwell's Island. I am speaking of the attacks on Alzheimer's patients in 2022 and the death of a Detroit man, Norman Bledsoe, who was beat to death by a 20 year old in the Westwood nursing home in Michigan. And this did not result in any grand jury. This did not result in any sort of legislative change as it did under Nellie Bly's time. So what happened to Nellie Bly after this experiment? Well, in March 1895, she met Robert Seaman at a dinner party on a train and a month later married her. An article announcing their marriage called him one of the most carefully dressed men in New York. 
Seaman was almost 40 years older than Bly, and his loved ones were suspicious, sure that she had married him for his money or a stunt report, and Bly was accused of being a stunt reporter at the time, where she would pretend to be married and then write about it. After their marriage, they resided in his home on West 37th Street in New York City. In 1896, they traveled to Europe, returning to New York in 1899 to take care of problems with his business. In 1904, Seaman was struck by a horse and wagon while crossing a street, and he died of heart disease brought on by his injuries. His business, which was dedicated to wholesale grocery and ironclad manufacturing, manufacturing cans for shipping milk on trains and enameled kitchenware, um, was promoted as being then owned exclusively by Nellie Bly, the only woman in the world personally managing industries of such a magnitude. After his death in 1904, Bly became the energetic and innovative president of the Ironclad Manufacturing Company. Later, however, there was embezzlement on the part of employees, and this destroyed the company. At its peak, Ironclad employed 1,500 people and could produce 1,000 steel barrels daily, but then charges of fraud led to bitterly contested bankruptcy proceedings beginning in 1911. The Ironclad Manufacturing Company eventually succumbed to debt, and Bly returned to newspaper reporting, covering women's suffrage events and Europe's Eastern Front during World War I. She died in 1922. She did inspire a board game, which is really exciting. She did go around the world beating a world record, um, continuing with her reporting. So her role as a female journalist is really remarkable and I look forward to seeing other work by her. Lifetime Movies, for example, did a Nellie Bly piece, uh, Christina Ritchie in the titular role. So I'm curious to see if there are, will be more works about Nellie Bly in the future.